Welcome to the Improvement Nerds Podcast, where it's our goal to bring together a bunch of improvement nerds in order to start and improve evolution by providing people with a new tool set, a new skill set, and a new mindset. We're grateful that you're spending time with us today. If you enjoy what you hear, please follow our podcast and subscribe because there's sure to be good content that occurs in these conversations as we nerd out. In episode 14, I nerd out with friend Andrea Butcher from HRD Advisors. The thing that we get nerdy about is something that a lot of people often overlook. We talk about the importance of HR as an element of any organization's growth strategy. A lot of organizations focus on their priorities. They develop plans to execute on key initiatives, oftentimes overlooking the important question of, do we have the resources, the talent, and engagement to actually execute on these ideas? At HRD and through her podcast, which is recorded weekly, she increases awareness about this important question, helping organizations here stateside and globally understand the importance of having a talent strategy. I know that you're going to enjoy this episode. Andrea is a very talented speaker. I'm so thankful that she's come onto our episode to share her experience and her passions. As you listen to her story, I hope it resonates with you and you grow in your understanding what it means to be a leader. I encourage you to reach out to Andrea and to follow her on social media and be sure to subscribe to her podcast, which is Being at Work. Hi, Improvement Nerds. This is Tom West back with another episode. I have an exciting guest to share with you uh, who will be talking about leadership and the importance of being a leader and how you can develop those skills of being an effective leader. So today I've got Andrea Butcher. Um, So as she jumps in and she shares a little bit about her, her work and her passion I want to first start out that we, we in prep to this, discovered that we're almost new neighbors. Uh, she's moved into the similar area, which I'm raising my family, and we were nerding out about this area and all the cool things uh, that are provided for us in this small community. And she showed up to this episode wearing her running hat <laughs> and her shirt. So she just logged some miles this morning, and uh, I'm envious because I've yet to get out there and log my miles. But you know, where, we, where we're raising our family and the sport that we love, we have that in common. So we've already, before we started this episode, the two of us already nerded out about those two things, <laughs> about raising our family and sharing a little bit about our kids and also the sport that we love. So she's done a, a couple of half, half marathons and she shared a war story with me about doing one in the bitter, <laughs> the bitter cold in January. So, yeah. so I know. Well, we're so glad you're here today, and you you had warned us you'd run, you got your endorphins kicking, you're like, this is going to be high energy, so <laughs> so excited you're here today. Let's get started with allowing you to take the floor and kind of introduce who you are, and then from there, we're going to move to quickly what nerds you out. So I know you've got a key focus, you've been working within uh, the advising space to help HR professionals for quite a while, yeah. and in that, you've discovered some best practices and you're here today to talk about those things so let's rewind that though and let's kind of talk about how you got into this space and a little bit more about your background yeah thank you Tom I'm so glad to be here there is nothing I'd rather do than spend a morning after a run talking leadership development that is certainly my passion so I'm so fortunate to get to do that work at HRD advisory group so we're a full service HR consulting firm We are talent strategists, as we call ourselves, on a mission to elevate the entire employee experience through executive search, talent development, talent processes, and outplacement are our four practice areas. And my background and focus in most throughout most of my career has been on talent development. I'm an executive coach. I have a couple of coaching certifications and um, just have such a passion for coming alongside leaders particularly in the midst of the major challenges that we're leading through right now. Um, There is a model that we use at HRD and that I've actually used for over 20 years called the Leadership Challenge. And I have found, um, having used, gosh, maybe hundreds of different models at this point throughout my career, I have found that it is the most tangible, specific way to focus on leadership behavior. So I would love to nerd out with you today about that topic. 
Yeah, you know, there's a lot of conversation about leadership right now. And in, in the career you've had, I'm sure there's been other peaks around the topic. Um, but even before our nation, um, you know, had this chaotic event around COVID and all the uncertainty, I saw a uptick uh, in leadership. So a lot of focus on the importance of leadership and there's been a lot of resources uh, in blogging or podcasting or training. And I'd hate, in looking at that, I'd hate to say a lot of the conversation's been about tools and not as much about mindset or behavior. So I'm so glad you're here to, to nerd out about specifically leadership behaviors and why those are just as important as any other part of, you know, that, that individual's development. So you can equip yourself with tools and techniques. And if you don't use those tools, you know, you're not going to wear grooves in them and you're not going to get comfortable in them. Um, But beyond that, you know, it's what those tools allow to occur in the people that that leader is responsible for giving guidance to. So, you know, those tools are helpful, but, you know, if that person's using those tools just to get, you know, results or to check the box and they're not doing it authentically to develop those around them, those those tools just fall short. So totally pumped up that that you're nerding out about let's let's not just, you know, walk the walk, but let's let's do the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well in the the leadership challenge model that I reference actually starts with modeling the way is the first practice area. And quite purposefully, because it is all about who you are and how you show up as a leader that sets the tone then for everything. You know, if uh, if a leader isn't credible, if they're not someone that can be trusted to follow through with what they say they're going to do, you know, it's, it's unlikely that anyone will want to follow that leader. So, yeah, it starts with taking a look in the mirror every single day and asking, what way am I modeling? What kinds of leadership ripples am I creating today? You know, in the awareness of that, like then we're able to make choices and adapt and push ourselves out of our comfort zone for uh, to be what the people around us need in any particular moment. Yeah, that's such a important focus. There, there's a lot of leadership models that are out there. And one of the ones I've been exposed to is the Baldridge Criteria for Excellence. Mm-hmm. I've been a volunteer examiner for three years. And that framework starts with leadership. It's category one. Yeah. And the very first question they ask is in the in the framework about mission, vision, and values. So how do you as a leader contribute to the design of those things and ensure that those values and your values are aligned and that you're effectively role modeling them? So there's a lot of process and behavioral questions in that framework. And I imagine in the leadership challenge, they're asking those same really, really hard questions of, you know, how do the values of the organization you represent and your personal values align? Or how do your behaviors role model those expected behaviors of others? Because in a leadership role, individuals look up to that leader and they're going to emulate what that leader is doing because that's the culture that they think is present and they want to, you know, fit with that culture. So if the leader's acting or behaving in an inconsistent fashion, they're going to get a wildly varied culture because they don't that culture doesn't really have a touchstone to look at and to uh, follow has a model so i'm glad that 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 is part of your focus that's part of your models focus i'm i'm glad to see a lot of the models are starting to Mm -hmm. realize that that's an important piece of the puzzle yeah yeah there's um there's an interesting piece of research in the leadership challenge literature so it's a it's for almost 40 years of research. Jim Cousins, Barry Posner are the, are the researchers behind the model. And one of the questions they ask is uh, to, to employees and team members is when you have a new leader, what is it that you most want to know about him or her? And so, you know, we often think like, we're, they're going to want to know, like, what do they want me to do? And what will our focus be? And When I ask people that question, those are the kinds of responses I typically get. When you look at the research, the number one question that people want to know about a new leader is, who are you? 
So even before where are we going, what will our focus be? Like, I want to know who you are. I want to know what you stand for. I want to know what's important to you. I want to know about your family. I want to know what your background, you know, that, um, that those connection points. Yeah. It's, it's all about that. I, and, and I have a theory. I'm curious what your theory is as to why leaders think that's what their role is in answering in a default way, like to provide guidance or set direction or to communicate the goals or to establish the tactic or align the resources. A lot of uh, ta- like tactical or checkboxy like activities. So my, my theory is the way that we're showing up is a result of how we were trained and groomed through yeah. whatever institution we got our educations from or the system that promoted us into that role. So those systems oftentimes incentivize decisiveness and, you know, uh, goal orientation. And for me, as I showed up in the workplace, that's what I thought leadership was all about is to go around and tell people what to do, how to do it and why to do it. And I totally yeah. had it upside down and backwards yeah. and I was a complete dirtbag. Um, but I, <laughs> no, I wouldn't yeah. say that. <laughs> but I, I'm guessing a lot of people are making that mistake too. Because well, I agree with you. I think we confuse management and leadership and certainly the two go hand in hand and there's a lot of overlap and they support each other and both are really, really important. But like for the purposes of this conversation, right, we're talking leadership. So when we ask the question, what do you expect of a leader? I think a lot of times people are in interpreting manager. And so naturally it's more of the hands-on. If you look at the root of each of those words, it helps with the distinction. So the root of the word manager, it's, it's manus and it means hands. So hands-on, right? Tactical activities versus the root of the word leader means to guide. And so if we think about like, who do I want to follow? I want to follow someone that I trust, that's credible, that knows what they're talking about, that has something that's important to them that they stand for. I mean, I think about, um, have you ever been whitewater rafting? Yes. Yeah. So I've been whitewater rafting one time and it was terrifying, but what got me through the experience, like one of the key things was the calm focus confidence of the guide, the person Mm -hmm. that was taking us through that. It wasn't their first rodeo, right? They'd done it hundreds of times. They knew the river so well. They knew all of the ups and downs. They knew if someone got thrown off, like exactly what to do. So I trusted that. Like that brought me so much comfort through the process. And I think that's um, like, yeah, I wanted to know getting on that raft, like who is this guide? Mm-hmm. And how is he or she going to help me down this river? It's, it's really, it's not unlike our day to day, right? Right. Think about right now, like the tumultuous times that we're in the midst of, you know, just before our conversation, like I sent a Slack message to my team, just happy Tuesday. Like what's everyone up to? I just finished a run. Here's my top three today. What are you guys focused on? And just that quick connection point to say to them, okay, she cares about me. She's positive today. You know, look at her modeling the way, starting out the day with a run, right? That's Mm -hmm. very intentional. You know, these are people I care so much about, particularly in this challenging time. And I want to set the tone every day in a positive way. Like that's that modeling the way. What way am I modeling? That's that's the question that we all need to start with as leaders. I think the story you just shared about rafting for the listeners maybe who haven't done that and it also depends on what river you're rafting in the in the rating of the rapids. So if you're yeah. going and you're doing a trip with your small kids, you're going to be on two class two rapids and the risk is relatively low. Yeah. So but, but nonetheless, though, those guides, whether they're taking you on two, three or four, they have standards that they follow in order to build those relationships and create the trust. So I think your story about rafting is definitely something that people can relate to. For us, when we went to the national parks, uh, we visited Mammoth Cave. So I'm six foot four. I have a fear of heights and I'm claustrophobic. So, but <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to role model bravery for our kids. So some of the uh, tours were short, uh, low risk, and really uh, the safety 
um, the the likeliness of a an event happening were pretty small. But on those tours and on the really long tours in which things could get pretty dangerous, the the park rangers showed up in the same exact way. They met their whole tour group. They introduced themselves and they shared in, interesting information about who they were as people. And then they talked about how long they've been doing this and why they want why they're a park ranger. So they established rapport and they created relationships. And then, you know, as you get ready to enter the cave, you know, they go through that same checklist of here's how we work together while we're down here. Our priority is safety. So they had this process that they followed. Every one of the park rangers followed and Mm -hmm. that created trust. And the Mm -hmm. whole process I'm assuming wasn't designed in a boardroom and communicated out and said, here's how we as park (laughs) rangers create trust. It was more do it and learn and share your best practices and let's emphasize this as the the thing that we do best is to Mm -hmm. create trust and safety for our visitors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So I want to kind of move us from this leadership challenge, this focus on behaviors to more of uh, your journey into this. Like how, how Mm. did this, Great come question. about for you and mm-hmm. why is this important for you to, to make as a career choice? Well, you know, it's interesting because it, as you look back on your career, it's interesting to see how patterns emerge. And I, so I was always going to be um, a clinical psychologist. That was my, I was an undergrad psych major, always fascinated by why people do what they do. I remember even as a, even as a kid, just really paying attention to, challenges my friends were going through and always found myself in like a counseling, supportive, encouraging role. I've always been a glass half full kind of person. Mm -hmm. So showed up always with a lot of stick-to-itiveness around like, you'll get through this. It's going to be okay. And so definitely found that um, evolving as I started to graduate from college and apply to PhD programs. And I didn't get accepted into any of them. They were you know, very competitive programs. And it was the first time in my life I'd ever been told no. And so I was really like, what, what do you mean? I didn't get into this program. And I had, a, I was at Indiana state and I had a professor who said, um, Hey, have you looked at the master's program here on campus for human resource development? Mm. I'm like, no, what's that? And he said, well, you took an industrial organizational psychology class that you really liked. It's basically that. Mm -hmm. So go check that out. And so I did and and loved it. And my parents were school teachers. And so I didn't have a good business context. But what I found through that human resource development master's program was a lot of focus on talent development, people development, assessments, measuring Mm -hmm. and evaluating learning leadership development and just all of those concepts just really resonated and aligned. And so when I graduated with my master's degree, uh, it was a great job market at that time. And I moved to Chicago and joined a company called Premier Farnell, a global electronics business and found myself very quickly, even though I started as an HR generalist, found myself very quickly gravitating towards talent development. I was coaching managers I was working with and there was no centralized learning function at that business at that time. And so I went to uh, the head of HR and was such a proponent for that. Like there's pockets of learning. I said, let's bring them together. And so we did, we formed a performance improvement team that I ended up leading and driving. And one of the things um, that he tasked me with pretty quickly, the head of HR was some centralized leader development. And I did some research and, from my master's program, I remembered the leadership practices inventory. That's the assessment that goes with the leadership challenge. I remembered that. So I brought that to that business. And so that was, gosh, that was you know, two, over 20 years ago. I was doing the leadership challenge at that business and had a lot of success with that. Uh, that's, that's one of the great things, just if I could maybe spend one more minute on the whole behavioral piece. The thing that I really like about that model for each of the, there are five practices of exemplary leadership. Basically, the research, the researchers have asked the question, when leaders are at their best, what are they doing? And 
through the research, what they find is that leaders are modeling the way, inspiring a shared vision, challenging the process, enabling others, and encouraging the heart. And then for each of those five practice areas, there are six behaviors. And so what's helpful for leaders is it's, it's something that you can get your arms around. Like I know at any time, if I'm challenged, I can ask, like, what would model the way do? What would inspire a shared vision do? And I've got these specific behaviors that I can demonstrate, right? So if, if I'm at a loss or not sure, I can always go, go, always go to that model. It's very tangible. And so it's helpful because it's easy to get your arms around. The assessment then gives you a good measurement of how often you're demonstrating those behaviors. So when we coach and take leaders through development processes, we can do we can do a pre-assessment and a post-assessment to see like did the needle move through this development initiative. So we were doing that work at this organization I was a part of, and then I joined a consulting business. And do, was doing a lot of leadership development there as well. And so once again, continued to use the tool with clients. And I've joined the uh, Leadership Challenge community and got to work with the researchers and get to know them a little bit. And have just continued to use, to use the model throughout my career because of the credibility, because it's research-based. I mean, so it's, you can't argue with the research. Mm-hmm. And because it's behavioral, like those have been the two things that have really just power punched that, that program for me. Thank you for circling back to the model. And so there's two things. One, we're not broadcasting the video, but you like you're lighting up, you're giving (laughs) us a lot of your inner nerd right here. So like your nerd peaked a little bit when you defined manager and leader and you returned it to their, their roots and in the language and what those two things mean. That was like, I almost wanted to, you know, sneeze and say the word nerd. Um, (laughs) But then coming into this here, as you talk about this model, it's really obvious that this is a a passion for you, but it's, and and it's not just like your career, but this is your purpose in Mm -hmm. some ways. Like you've seen this model and the impact it can have. Yeah, it's based on research. And I think like there are very measurable outcomes, but when yeah. individuals who are struggling yes. and yes. find this resource and then are over, able to overcome that struggle, yeah. that personal yeah. transformation is probably what sold it and continues to sell it. Yes. And the fact that there is a universal nature to these behaviors, so they've replicated the research around the world and they find, they find the, same, the same behaviors apply. So right now we have a couple of global clients that we're using, we're uh, putting leaders through an eight month development process. And so just this morning at 6 a.m., I was on a webinar with leaders in India and Dublin and Australia. And there's a leader in India after the call that emailed me and was just expressing so much gratitude because she's a new leader. And so she says, I've been lost and I've not been sure what to do. And that is the thing that just lights me up is because what other profession do we take people and we put them into roles, but then we don't equip them with the skills necessary. So Ken Blanchard shares some research that 60% of all new leaders will fail in their first two years because of that. Because we say like, you were really good at what you did. So good luck. You can do it. You're going to be awesome. And so like her, so Rushi is her name. And there she is in Pune, India. Someone, you know, she did really good work, but now all of a sudden she's being asked to lead this group of people. Ah, I don't know what to do, but now she does. Now she's been given a model that says like, you want to be effective, do these things. So start with who are you as a leader? What's your leadership philosophy? What are your values? What do you stand for? Then work with the team to create a set of shared values. And around that, you can identify a shared vision that you're all working towards together. That that then gives you something to challenge, the status quo around. Mm -hmm. And then all along, you're enabling and encouraging your team towards those things. So so very quickly, I mean, that's the thing that's so good about that model is regardless of the challenge I'm in, I can always ask myself, what way am I modeling? Where am I going? Where do I need to push myself out of my comfort zone? And how am I supporting the people around me? I, like, I love the questions. I, so as people listen to this, they're probably now shaking their heads 
yes, that happened to me. I was a strong individual performer. I knew my job and the ins and outs of it really well. And people identified me as a potential leader and they promoted me. And I moved into a role. In some cases, I I moved up within my own department. So I had this transition of being a friend now to that individual's leader. So sometimes there's conflict that occurs there because you were peers and now your your relationship and the dynamics have changed. So that's an interesting challenge. But absence of that, say they get promoted in a new or into a new organization, they, they oftentimes show up in an area where there's no orientation and no formal plan to help that person be successful. Exactly. So this is, I think, greatly needed. The other thing that I think is super, super cool in this model, and this is an assumption I might be like way off, but it's, it's not prescriptive. It's flexible. And it's a ruler in some ways to be able to take and assess a certain situation. Like here's the scenario that I see happening in front of me. And this could be happening for a handful of reasons. Maybe this is happening because the individuals don't have a role model or they don't understand the behaviors. So they're acting in highly varied ways or they don't know what our common goal is. So they're working in different directions. So you could take and say, what scenario am I seeing happen? And you don't you should do all those things. But sometimes four of those five things might be in place and you just have to detect, oh, the, exactly. the fifth wheel is wobbling a little bit. Yeah, I got to take that one and I have to insert, you know, a, a solution or effort there to get that piece back on track. In, in worst case scenarios, none of it's present and you got to do it all. But in most cases, I'm guessing it's probably one or two pieces that need to be revisited and brought back up and, and into everyone's focus. And I think if you could do that, I, th- I yes. think you're creating a different environment. Have you experienced that? Yeah. And I think you're spot on because style, style certainly shows up in those behaviors, like encouraging the heart I mentioned as one of the practices, right? So it's the fifth practice and there are behaviors around like uh, individually recognizing people for mm. contributions. So for a lot of people, that's very natural. So for me, I am a natural encourager. Like it is my greatest strength, encouraging and positivity. And so I'm never going to have to try to to focus on that. Like it's it's just who I am. There are some leaders who that's not as natural for. They they have hearts, but they just don't naturally think about that encouragement or lifting. Maybe they don't need a lot of affirmation themselves. Mm -hmm. And so there, there definitely is a style component, which is why that assessment is so helpful because it can tell you where you have where you have blind spots and I think you have challenges. So the model helps you to self-assess and identify these blind spots for yourself. But beyond that, an external yes. partner, someone who will give you the, the candid feedback you need is also important to be able to totally benefit from this because oftentimes there's blind spots we have that we can't discover for ourselves. Absolutely. And I think your story was really helpful because this creating the vision component, Mm -hmm. you have individuals that are really strong strategic or big picture thinkers. And because those things happen so easily for them, they assume that that big picture thinking occurs naturally in everyone else. So that that's a blind spot oftentimes for those individuals. Yeah, and you got it. Right now, this uh, this group in India that I mentioned I'm working with, they're technical leaders. And so not surprising, you know, they've got a very like firefighting mentality. And so when we uh, when we when we did the assessment, we saw that inspiring a shared vision was the lowest across all. And I mean, no one was surprised by that, but it just gave us it just gave us a lot of emphasis on that focus area, right? That that's something you're going to have to be really intentional about. And uh, so, yeah, so now, so they've all identified specific behaviors within that practice that they're, that they're focused on integrating into their day to day so that their team members feel more aligned and connected to the big picture of the organization. It's so fun to see that. And that's a situation where you've got a president that's a large global organization. And so there's one specific business unit that we're working in. The president of that group took her executive team through this last year and it went really well. They saw incredible results. 
it was interesting. She started getting like through the year, a lot of anecdotal feedback from people like, wow, like your team and people really started to notice some differences specifically around that inspiring a share vision. There was a, an elevator pitch that they all rallied around that, that really um, took wave and across the organization and people started to notice it. And so now this year we're scaling the program around the world to all of the managers and directors in that business unit. There's a few hundred going through it. And it's, so it's so fun to see how like a common language and a whole group, like that's, that's really fun work. That's a common language is culture creating, right? And in, yes. in some ways in you, um, in this story you were sharing, I think a lot of organizations struggle to start their transformation journey because they see it as this monster, this um, huge effort that's going to take a lot of time and energy and resources to get done. And they just fail to launch and they never get started because it's so intimidating. Whereas in the story you just shared, it's let's start somewhere. Let's identify a Petri dish or yes. in a, uh, they call them centers of excellence or uh, the model cell. These are nerdy terms in process improvement world. So let's find a model cell, which is a unit that is change ready or a unit that's an outlier. They got a lot of issues. And if we can fix it there, we can fix it everywhere. So you partner with this model cell and you experiment and you learn what works and what doesn't work. And then you try to replicate from that model cell to the next environment, the next environment. And eventually this, through all these cycles of learning, you, you're able to take a small idea and grow it at scale and then fully deploy it. So it sounds yeah. like in some ways that's, that's been your guys' approach into partnering with organizations is let's not boil the whole ocean. No. Let's get a small little cup here and get that thing boiling and then see where we can go from, from that experiment into yeah, a larger because, scale. Because these, these participants now, their leaders went through it. So there's an internal support mechanism that we could never have provided. So this the there's it's so much more meaningful. There's context around it. Yeah, it's I think you're spot on in that start with a group, nurture that. The challenge with that is we know that of like there's so much of a short-term results oriented right now focus. So it it definitely takes a willingness to to focus on the longer term, the bigger picture, and really bringing value. Yes. And I think that is definitely something that is important. There's a lot of focus right now on the short term, uh, you know, response and what are we doing now? And a lot of time and energy is being spent on the day to day. And I, I think we have to remember that this is, this is a, yes, a, something very disruptive. And I think on the other side of COVID, there's going to be a lot of change. But right now, not not very many people are giving themselves the time and the space to think about the future. They're so overwhelmed by the present and what's happening in the short term that the visionaries aren't looking out the window. Maybe they are, but they're not communicating it just yet. Maybe the audience yeah. of the big picture thinking aren't ready to hear it. But that's that's where we're going to, as a society, not just move past this, but on the other side, potentially be better and have, you know, grown together yeah. as a society, grown as individuals and refocused our energy on those things that uh, during this this moment of crisis, we were able to become more intimately aware of and make decisions about mm -hmm. as to that's unacceptable and once we're past this, we need to make sure something like that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So true. Yeah. So it's paying attention through all of it. Like, what are we learning through this? How are we growing through this? Yeah. yeah that's great. Yeah. So I, 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 did I hear somewhere in one of your stories that you're a sycamore? Did you say you went to Indiana state? I did. All right. Well, we're going to have, I, in, there's probably <laughs> four hours of prep we should have done together because we. Did are you certain, go to Indiana State? I, I'm a sycamore. So. Oh I, my God. <laughs> yeah. I loved my time there. And um, I was a 
uh, a runner, an athlete there. And that okay. was, that was that community. The, it was a family that I was welcomed into and I'm bringing it up because um, Indiana state is small enough, but big enough that it, most people don't know about it, but those who discovered it have really benefited from the community that existed there. And you were talking a little bit about how transformations happen when we were talking about like this Petri dish yeah. type and let's do this model cell and then replicate so yeah. on and so forth. And that over time takes like a small group of uh, early adopters and innovators and then replicates and grows and scales and get more and more people on board and you create not just a culture, but you create a community. And communities are really important systems and structures for people. They always have been an important part of people is the community of people that that person belongs to. Originally, it was for safety. And, you know, in numbers, if there's a threat, you know, you were less likely to uh, be the one who suffered severely from that threat when you worked together and collaboratively because there was safety in numbers. But nowadays, community isn't just for safety, but it's for um, re- poten- the, it's a vehicle by which individuals can realize their their more full potential. So at Indiana State, like I was young, naive, and uh, really didn't know what I wanted to become when I grow- grew up. But because I went to that school and on that cross country team and on that track team, I met individuals and worked under a coach who had big picture thinking. I grew up in a way that I probably wouldn't have had I not gone there. So that community gave helped me to get my values around you. You work hard. So can't never did nothing is one of those things is that you, you show up and you do the hard work because it's hard work that pays off, even if you don't perform well. On race day, if you did all the hard work before then, you, you know, yes. that's, that's all you could have controlled, really. So I think communities help to shape people. And I love, I love that that's also a piece of your guys' focus is because there's a lot of individuals entering the workforce right now um, that maybe hadn't had the chance to get those values so there's you know individuals who have been raised in a digital world and don't know how to have frank two-way communications and they need to learn those skills and communities can kind of help develop people even without formal training programs belonging to a group Mm -hmm. of individuals who have a common purpose and a shared value is development for a person yes completely agree with that for certain Yeah. So I'm thankful for my time at state. And, you know, the other thing outside of doing the hard work was, um, was to give back. So that was the other value that was role modeled on that team was to be a servant of your community. So our coach, he's now passed, but John McNichols, he built trail systems and he hosted local races Mm. and he tried to motivate the Terre Haute community to be more active and he was a busy person and like he was coaching us and he had his own family and he was doing things for the university and yet he carved out time to do things for the community so everyone under his leadership and and the community he created walked away from that realizing they too had that responsibility to carve out time mm-hmm. to, serve, to serve others so um all of this like that that's the bigger picture is these individuals when they group together, they become teams and mm-hmm. team, teams become communities and these things, they become this um, extended family in some ways that helps individuals have somewhere where they can belong and contribute, contribute to, but also benefit from. So. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't know about you, but right now, you know, in the midst of these challenging times, like I'm so relying on my tribe. Yeah. Or tribes, I will say, you know, I've got like a family chat group going. I've got like a girlfriend chat group. I've got my life group from church. I'm in a, I'm in a round table. I've got that one. You know, I've got an HR leader forum that I'm staying connected to. So yeah, I'm just really leaning into these communities right now for encouragement and support and this sense of we're in this together. Mm-hmm. That's so motivating, so inspiring. It is. Yeah. Individuals can be 
self-defeating when they feel like they're facing it all alone. There's a theory in Iron Man, so I know you do endurance sports, um, but they, they call it the suffering community. The and suffering community. so when you're out and you're doing the Iron Man race, you're, you're going to hit the wall and it's going to hurt super, super bad. And um, they say the only reason individuals can persevere and overcome it is because everyone else around them is doing it too. And I think, I think the multiplier effect happens is mm-hmm. everyone together on that course, they're struggling in the same way. And because you have that shared experience, you get that little a boost of confidence that, that if they're struggling, you can struggle too. And that, that's what they contribute to so many people being able to successfully finish those races Yeah, is those suffering communities because you don't feel you're suffering alone. Right. But you're striving together. And I think when you talked about tribes and when we talked about community, yeah. I, to kind of sum it all up, that's the role of a leader is to mm-hmm. create those communities so that everyone can mm-hmm. thrive. Absolutely. And everyone has a soft place to fall, right? You've, you've got a group to go to for support and encouragement and a place to be vulnerable and real. That's what we need right now. I think even when we're not facing crisis, that's still mm, really, always. really important. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and call, and call me an eternal optimist. You know, I, I am, but this has um, escalated really quickly and I do believe it can escalate quickly in the other direction as well. You know, I think about the ups and downs of life a lot and, yeah, we may be in the midst of a valley, but there's a there's a peak a coming, no doubt. Yes. So thank you for coming on to the episode and sharing your passion and and being vulnerable and talking about your life experiences and why this is important to you and how you've seen it not just be effective in helping organizations get results, but your own personal experience and how it's helped you mature as a person and how you've seen it transform others. I think a lot of times when people come and they talk about a model, they talk about, oh, you know, here's the growth that it achieved and organizations that use this, they get these Mm. results. You didn't bring up any of that. You brought up, here's Mm. all the individuals I've seen benefit Mm. from thinking this way. So I appreciate you coming on and and focusing on the the human case for, Mm. for investing in leadership, because I think sometimes individuals come in and they try to make a business case for it. And not that there isn't, but I think the human case trumps it. Mm-hmm. The human so spirit. Yeah. Yes. And, and what that igniting that fire within all those people enable you to do. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you, Tom. So great to connect with you. Yes. Thank you. Enjoy your day. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. What an awesome episode with Andrea. Very thankful that she stopped by, that she had this conversation with us. There was a lot of things I enjoyed about what she'd brought up. I love how she nerded out and talked about the difference between management and leadership and that both roles are equally important in organizations. I love that she talked about there are certain leadership behaviors and role modeling that needs to occur in order to give a model or examples to everyone within the organization on how they should behave and how they can best contribute to the organization's mission, vision, and values. One of the things I enjoyed most about her presentation and about our conversation was her focus on investing in others, that growth and development, teaching and training, coaching and mentoring, I don't care how you say it, but giving people the skills they need to actually achieve is the most important investment any organization can make. So at the start of this episode, when I talked about their role, uh, HRD's role, in making sure organizations have a talent strategy in place, I think that is twofold. It's recruiting and onboarding and bringing talent into your organization, but it's also about maximizing the talent that you already have and investing in them the skills that those people need to make and lead change. 